All right, hi everyone, and welcome to our March EnviroStars Small Business Meetup. In this series, we host monthly 30-minute meetups with EnviroStars small recognized businesses um, and business owners to discuss topics related to sustainable business practices. Today, we're looking forward to speaking with Glenn, who is here, and he is the owner of 3R Technology. Welcome, Glenn. Thank Can you, Chris. Yeah, can you tell us, love that background, by the way. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about your company and how it started? Sure, absolutely. It probably, probably a good place to start would be my parents actually, because they they grew up through through the Great Depression, the actual, the first depression, not the one that we just experienced um, not too long ago, but they came from a background of having nothing really having nothing. My dad worked in a glass factory when he was 10. My mom wasn't much better off than that. So as they evolved and they did both end up going to college, my dad went through the GI Bill, um, got his degree, she got her degree, they moved forward in life, but they still had this basic ethic of you don't consume very much, you repair what you have if you can, you fix it, you reuse it, you you basically scrimp along, you, you save things, you, you value what it takes to actually make something and use it in your life. So they've always had that ethic. And we grew up with that, me and my siblings. So I've carried that forth even before I started 3R Technology. I was always somebody who didn't really want to buy something new. I would try to fix what I had or buy something used or uh, buy something refurbished. And so 3R Technology really grew out of that. We, we have a, a plant that processes electronics, but really our first goal is to reuse as much as possible. So everything comes to the door, whether it's convenient or not, sometimes we're trying to fix it, refurbish it, trying to find a new home for it. If we can't, then we do the responsible recycling for it. But that that really was sort of the formation of it. You know, in the middle, I did a lot of different things. Um, I worked a lot in IT, I had an IT services company. So I was doing that in, in my own practice where rather than replace a, a client's machine, if I could fix it or upgrade it, I would do that. Out of that process, I was upgrading and collecting uh, parts along the way at sometimes not being able to figure out how I could reuse it. I had to recycle it. And so that was, I was looking for options at that time. And then out of that, I looked around and said, well, there isn't a whole lot. And the King County Take It Back Network, uh, Lisa Sapansky has been driving that for many years. So she uh, contacted uh, local businesses that might be good partners in that operation. And what that established was a network of independent operators who could facilitate recycling the electronics that was being generated regionally and prevent it from being in the landfills. So it was, it was concurrent with landfill bans on electronics TVs principally to begin with. So it was sort of a matter of timing. And, and again, my background just, it's just something that just always has been part of my, my being uh, in my ethics. So it, it really, the apple didn't fall far from the tree in my case. So, and we're such a technology rich uh, environment around here. I mean, glutted really. And we, we take that for granted, but there's really a lot of opportunity to reuse this technology that we have in a high tech sector, like a high tech area, like uh, the Pizza Sound and find new homes for it. Low income individuals, nonprofits, individuals to use within their, within their homes. So there's a whole ecosystem of reuse that's possible. And, and we're very fortunate to be in an area where that's possible. Yeah, I was, I was excited to get to talk to you because I have a background in like resource recovery and recycling, um, waste management, that type of stuff, but not specifically in the e-waste yeah. kind of sector. And so I'm wondering for you, it sounds like, you know, you've always had this philosophy of reusing, you know, what you have. Um, does that get a lot trickier when you're talking specifically about electronics? Is it more complicated? It certainly can be, and a lot of it is has to do really with the way things are designed to be outmoded. So even if you can reuse a, tech, uh, a computer, a computer could be 20 years old and work perfectly well. There's nothing wrong with it. You could do something to repair it and it works perfectly well. However, as software advances, as operating systems move forward, their whole design uh, MO is to make this old equipment outdated so they can sell you new equipment. So it's kind of part of the the struggle of capitalism, if you will, that in order to keep selling you products, they have to make the old products uh, out of date and, and they can do that, they can force that. Manufacturers, OEMs can, can force products to not be compliant with new operating systems and then all of a sudden you're, you're stuck, right? So it's sort of by design. 
Yeah, that's the it's it's planned obsolescence, yeah. isn't that what they yeah. yeah. Planned obsolescence, and it's absolutely the directive that's been present in you know all the large scale computer manufacturers for for years. Wow, wow, yeah, that would get complicated. I'm also curious because you know we've been talking to businesses a lot about how they've pivoted their operations or how their business has changed during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, which has now been what, over a year since yeah. the beginning of the pandemic. I assume, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that this for you has been a huge change um, because people, not just because people are interacting, I mean, I guess it is, people are interacting with technology, I feel like, more and in a very different way. It's you mean just like kind getting of on Zoom? <laughs> getting on Zoom and having yeah, an interview? Like doing something. a Zoom interview. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it hit us pretty hard right away, as it did a lot of businesses. So things just shut down. So things just, last March just stopped. It just fell right off and that was a pretty scary moment. We were fortunate that we're an essential business. So for a lot of the sectors that still need our services, we need to be we needed to be operational, but we had to we had to downscale a little bit temporarily. And then we were fortunate to be able to spring back. We we did a lot of things during that period that in in a few conditions that helped us. One is that yes, because people were online more and interacting differently with technology, all of a sudden there was a great demand for for uh, you know, distance learning, working remotely to have a laptop or tablet that maybe you didn't have before. So we had huge demand for that. We had, we were fortunate to have a little bit of a back stock of, of that equipment to process. So we were able to get that out and get those to, to people as quickly as possible. So that helped keep us, keep the doors open. The other thing that we did is we just, we used that downtime, the silver lining was just to get more effective and efficient operationally. Sometimes when you're so busy, you don't have time to fix the things that you know you need to work on. So we completely retooled our operations, got ourselves so that we were able to process things more efficiently, more uh, quickly, and also improve how we were tracking and, and, and doing reuse on a, on a number of different levels. So that was a real silver lining. The, but some things changed too. We had two brick and mortar locations. We ended up closing one. Um, the other one is not fully open yet. Our, at our main facility. And a lot of people I know in the community, that's one of the most common questions I get around 3R technology, just talking to people, you know, that kind of anecdotally, they will say, hey, when's your store gonna be open? Because a lot of people love shopping at the store and, and just that, that environment to come in, people that are fix it people, gadget people, people wanting an inexpensive solution, um, you know, techies and just, yeah, people that DIY type people. So that's been one change, but then again, out of that, we've also, we pivoted more online. We were already doing reuse and, and selling refurbished products online. And now we've expanded that. We have a new Shopify store. We have a, an enhanced presence on, on eBay, and which is a very common platform for trying to find a home for stuff like this. So we were able to get more inventory up and change how we did things. And, and so it's, that's cool and that was a big change for us and again it, it helped keep people employed and we dropped down for a little while um, but then we were able to bring pretty much everybody back on board um, except you know one or two people I believe that moved on at that point um, and actually went a different direction but uh, that that was really key for us is to keep people employed and safe at the same time and of course there was, like any business we had struggles with that. Yeah that's great. I also kind of want to get a sense of, um, again, you know, my background, I, I don't have as much um, knowledge about about e-waste and, and that sector. And so what is it about 3R technology that sets it apart from other, other like businesses or other businesses that are looking to recycle e-waste? Like what makes you guys, um, you know, the best? What, what makes you the most sustainable? Uh, yeah, I love the question because it's, I really believe that. I think during different times of our operation, we've been around, this is our 18th anniversary actually, oh, coming up in April. So we've been around the, we've been around the block a few, uh, a few times and early on in the operation when you're learning in, in, in its inception, like any business owner, I was learning the ropes sometimes as I, as I went along. I was learning the industry as I went along. Uh, I knew this was an important thing to do. I knew this was an important mission. Uh, it was it was an emerging industry. There weren't a lot of things necessarily standardized. There weren't the certification standards that there are now. So there was a lot of work to do 
and a lot of room for improvement. And we always have room for improvement. Anybody can say that they're the best or that they're better than everybody else, but you have to keep working on it. It never changes. You can't stand still. That being said, I really can confidently say that we're the best regionally. I really believe that. And for a number of reasons, the certification standards are one of one of those reasons. We're R2 2013 certified. We're NAID AAA standard uh, uh, certified. These are things that help protect you as a customer for what happens to the material after you hand it off to us for data security, for how we work with our, our team for their own safety, for their own health, for the local environment, for our downstream and where the, where the material goes. So all those things are really important and those get addressed in the standards, but we really try to exceed those. And, and beyond that, I think the, there's a number of things I think that are really important and some of it, the biggest part is really the team. I know people say this and it's, it's kind of a cliche, take care of your team and you, they'll take care of your customers. But I really believe in that from the beginning. I really didn't want to work with anybody I didn't like and that I didn't feel like was a really good human being and felt like they were dedicated to what we were doing. And I feel that confidently about everybody that works at 3R. They're all dedicated to what we do. They care about each other. They care about the team. They care about our ability to do things well and, and how important it is to, to, for recycling and reuse and, and to do it effectively. So. I think those are those are the real key things that distinguish us. We're also, you know, talking about improvement. We're always trying to make things better. Again, it doesn't have anything to do with the standards. It, it's built in. It's baked into those standards. But we're we're doing that in other ways. We're doing that in the software that we use, the systems that we develop, the ways that we're trying to recover as much potential reuse out of the equipment and materials that we re, that we receive. So that's and then the other things that impact just the operation itself. You know, going to LED lighting. Um, you know, working on transportation for uh, our team members, um, working with local nonprofits for staffing. We work with World Relief, we work with Hero House. We do different programs that allow people to get employment and to start out perhaps with their first position, which is really cool. We've had a number of people that started with 3R and it was their very first job. Wow. And that's really cool. And particularly anybody who's, who watches this who doesn't know about Hero House, they should look that up. It's a it's a, an amazing organization. It's a clubhouse approach to mental health and building community engagement. They develop a, a job training and career skills and activities and all sorts of things that provide people with a much better environment than perhaps they they have had in the past. It's it's there should be one in every neighborhood or near nearly I think. That's it's an amazing called, organization. It's called Hero House. Yeah, Hero House Northwest, and they have three locations now. They start out just in Bellevue. They have one in Seattle, one in Everett now. But part of what they do is they've had individuals who are looking for just a step into employment, ten to fifteen hours a week. Not anything super complicated. Not anything that requires a lot of training. Not anything that requires a lot of special skills. And you know, you can see from the <laughs> what's behind me, which is a, a, a picture of shredded hard drives. We wow. have some things that are very much just manual labor. We have shredders that we use to uh, securely shred uh, clients' hard drives and other data containing materials. When we take apart a computer to recycle it, it's still by hand. You, you get out the cordless drill, you get the screws out, and you're taking the metal and the plastic off for recycling. You're taking the power supply, the motherboard out, the hard drive, RAM, CPU, all that. It's all a manual process. There's There are ways to do it faster, <laughs> but they won't, they won't involve a better material recovery uh, than doing it manually. So it's an old school method, but it's it's a tried and true way to do it. And I've done personally, I've probably done tens of thousands of them over the years easily. And it's kind of gratifying. <laughs> it's gratifying yeah. for people who've had bad experiences with computers too, and just want to just yeah. like, one. <laughs> like digging the hammer, right? <laughs> yeah, taking it apart. And, and um, yeah, it, it, it's kind of maybe, a, maybe some... Uh, interior gratification for past experiences. <laughs> but, but anyway, but that, that program, I feel really strongly about it. It's, it's so gratifying. We've had a number of individuals who come on then long term after that program. Uh, and they're, they're not committed to do that, but they, they come in as a, as a program you know, for a six month um, you know, period. And then after that, they may move on to other employment or they may decide that they want to do something different, but a lot of them have stayed on. And that's really cool. Uh, so yeah, there, it, it's, it's, it's you know, when I describe to people what we do, it is, there is some high-tech aspects, but there's a lot of low-tech aspects. And again, it's, it's, it's 
for people maybe who work in an iron working, you know, operation or do carpentry, they understand the sort of intrinsic, like gratification, to use that word again, of working with your hands. And it's, and it's cool to have that sort of operations. It's surprisingly unique these days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a couple of thoughts that came up when we were just discussing that, but I first want to acknowledge the fact that um, it kind of played into another question I was going to ask is, you know, you're very, your company is very much in line with operating as sustainably as, sustainably as possible because you're in that industry. Yeah. Um, but also it sounds like on the back end of operations, you know, without being this company that that is directly in that um, field, you're also facilitating other ways of being sustainable within your company culture, which sounds great, you know, uh, whether that be with transportation options or, or you know, uh, equity, all those, those sorts of um, those goals that you have. So that's, I, we, I really appreciate that. I think that that's it's really important for any business to be sustainable, but especially those within the sustainability industry, it's great to know that on the back end of operations, you're also, you know, uh, walking the talk, right? Yeah, well, so, yeah, and, and you know, when you're a small business owner, you're living it every day and you're experiencing it, why would you wanna work around people that are unhappy? Mm. Because you don't provide them healthcare or they don't have a 401k or they don't get paid time off those kinds of things. I mean, to me, these are sort of no brainers. I understand some businesses, especially when you're starting out, you just can't afford it. I mean, you're just yeah. trying to like, just cover, cover the, the nut and the not, you know, fall on the, fall on the well. But if you can afford it, these things are not only the, the human thing to do, but they're going to build a culture of people that want to be there, that want, you want to work with, that they want to work with you. And I think it's really important. We started a, we just launched it, but it's an emergency savings program. So it's sort of a bridge, if you will, a way to start out before you get to a 401k and with matching so that they could, you know, employees can take out a, a small, just a tiny little chunk of their paycheck, put it into a fund, and we match it. And it just is there. It's sort of a rainy day fund. It's, you know, your car breaks down, you have a, a dentist bill that, you know, is not going to be fully covered by your insurance. And, and so you just, you just kind of need that. And it, and it's sort of, you can use it without question, but it's a really cool new program with a local company called Secure. It's just launching it. And this idea I think is getting more traction because not everybody is at that point where they're thinking about the 401k. Not everybody's thinking about the future. They're thinking about right now. And I think that's another important issue that everybody needs to address with members of their team, particularly in industries where it's not, you know, you're not Microsoft software development. You know, everybody's getting paid sort of, you know, decent wages where a lot of things can be afforded at that point. You know, when you're a smaller business and, and you're doing things at a very grassroots level like we do, uh, these are things that are day-to-day -day concerns for people. Definitely. Got a freeze there. Um, what advice? Oh, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Sorry, I don't know if it's me or me or you, but we had a little oh. freeze there. This is this is the fun technology aspect here. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Am I am I good now? Yeah, you're good. Yep. Okay. All right. Good. Just want to make sure it's uh on my end. It's a little bit shaky too. So it's okay. We uh we just have a few questions left um, pivoting back to Envirostar specific, this program, yeah. the green business recognition, how has that affected your business if it has at all? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that like any of these standards or any certifications or any sort of third party confirmations of what a, a company does, it, it builds trust and credibility for customers. And I think that's one of the aspects for Envirostar is what it helps us to do. Uh, you've also supply resources and, and connections as we're looking into ways that we can improve and gives you sort of suggestions for things that you can do. I know a lot of it's self-driven, but it's it, just like our standards, that, like our two, we have to define it. You have to meet certain basic standards, you know, sort of standards of way you're approaching things, but you self-define what a lot of the, pro the problems and aspects that are specific to your operation. So that's helped us to keep refocused on those areas. We are probably maybe more fortunate than some because we are already are in an industry where, or our approach to the industry anyway, where we are adhering to these third party standards like R2 and, and AAA that already put us sort of above the bar for sort of a, a business in terms of just how green you are. We have to be green. So I think we, you know, it's again, it's, it's one of the things that's a, a piece of the big puzzle. And some of these standards sort of supersede what Envirostar's 
uh, you know, builds into the standard for, for, for being a green business. But it's a, it's a great program and I would encourage other people to, to look into it. And, and it's part of it is doing that deep dive to find out how you can continually improve things. There's always ways you can improve. There's always ways you can get more green and to do things more sustainably. And you can try to do things off the shelf, but you really have to do the heavy lifting yourself. Mm, that's a great, great point. Thanks for that. Um, our final question then is just what's next? What's next for your business? What's next for, for your technology? Well, yeah, uh, good question. We have one thing that we're doing right now very immediately, we have a, a shipping, a mail-in type program that we've built called Simply Cycle. And that's launching actually next week. And this is a partially in response to the to the pandemic, but something that we've been doing before. But typically, for example, Earth Month is coming up next month, April. We will do several hundred recycling events during the month of April. These are public collection events. These are uh, collection events at campuses, at corporate campuses, buildings for property management. And we've been doing that for years. Well, we're doing some of those next month, but we're not doing nearly as many. People are not back in their offices. People are you know, concerned, getting together in a group, even if it's outside and it's social distancing and all that, and we can do it safely. It's just not something that's, that's really prevalent right now. So this is a shipping program where people can get free boxes, free labels for a lot of things like laptops and mobile devices, small fees for other types of e-waste, computers, printers, and then they can ship it back to us. So it's a really easy like kind of one click, you know, putting information, download the label, stick it on a box, ship it to us. Or if you need the box, you know, put in your information, boom, box comes to you, you know, a few days later, hopefully if you're local and you put stuff in the box and put the label on it and, you know, away it goes. So it's, it's a really convenient, safe way, particularly the numbers are crazy, but if I told you that there were several billion devices in homes around the U.S., you'd think like, that's crazy. There can't be wow. sitting around the house, but there are, right? For every house, if you go, if you go home or you go into your office even, there's a closet full of cables and old cell phones and old peripherals, thing, things that you, you know, your Palm Pilot from back in the day. There's all these things sitting around that people are not recycling, don't know what to do with, uh, may not want to drive it somewhere, may not have had that time, the luxury. So this is a solution where they can ship it back to us in a box. And so this is a complement to some of the things that we're doing. It doesn't take the place of collection events. It doesn't take place of of our ITAD services, our, our e-waste recycling we're doing for our, our corporate clients, but it's a complement to this. So we're launching that next week. Uh, we continue to look forward to changes in our certification standards and reading that. We're looking at different ways to process circuit boards. Uh, there's circuit boards sort of behind me built, and these are hard drives that have been shredded, but they're circuit boards on hard drives. And the industry standard right now is to send those to a smelter where those are actually basically put through a furnace, they recover all the metals, they do it very effectively, there's lots of environmental controls, but it's energy intensive, it is, the, they lose the board itself, the fiberglass on the board. So we're looking for options where we can process the boards and do a higher level of recovery, smaller environmental footprint, lower energy, and there are some companies, some cutting edge companies that are coming up with solutions. So we're we're investigating those right now and, it, and hopefully we'll move that direction as soon as we can feasibly do it. But it's still a, a, a developing solution. Wow, well, that's great. You sounds like you've got a lot of awesome stuff going on, a lot of exciting uh, endeavors happening. So congratulations on all of that. Thank you. And um, I guess to wrap up, what's a good way for people who see this, what is a good way for them to reach out and contact you if they have any questions or they want to work with you? Um, is it the website would be a good place for them to start? Sure. I don't know if you're going to put show notes in here, but 3rtechnology.com, it's number three, letter R, technology.com. Number is 206 582 7100. So if anybody has questions about our services, uh, you can get to our online store there. Um, either of those is great. We're on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. We're sort of on Twitter. We're a small business. It's hard to be everywhere. But but definitely we're on Facebook and, and that's a great way to find us as well. But yeah, we love to hear from people. We've been doing 
actually seminars like this. We just started an AMA where people can get online and ask us any kind of questions they want on, on recycling. So if anybody's interested in joining one of those, we'll probably do another one here in about a couple of weeks. That's great. That's great. And um, also, you know, we encourage this network and that's, a, or I think we call it the Envirostar's Business Network. And um, it's basically just a place, a forum where Envirostar's registered businesses can come and talk to each other, network a little bit, ask questions. Um, so hopefully, Glenn, I think uh, if I haven't already, I'll send you an invite to get on that network. Yeah. And then anybody who is uh, within the Envirostar's kind of team and family can can jump in there and ask you questions and connect there with you as well. Perfect. Yeah, we'd love to do that. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It, this was a great conversation. I certainly learned a lot. I feel like I'm going to have more questions personally just on the e-waste side. So I may have to reach out to you yeah, after an this and just have you answer. For sure. Yeah, half an hour sometimes is not enough. We didn't even talk about plastics. I could give you half an hour conversation on plastics. Oh my gosh. We oh we could we may need to set aside hours for plastics. I can go on about them, but <laughs> that sounds great. Well, thank you so much, um, and look forward to seeing what discussions evolve later um, from this conversation. Yeah, I love it. Thanks for the time, Christy. Really appreciate being here.